Uh, so let's get this cracking. So in this video, I'm going to be doing a brief history lesson regarding the transatlantic slave trade. And I'm going to be proving its veracity through the means of historical literature. And what really prompted me to do this video is because you have a small minority of people that seems to be disputing or even trying to disprove the veracity of the transatlantic slave trade. And so they're basically, their, their point of contention is that you never had slaves taken from the West Coast of Africa and being brought into the Americas, whether it be North, South or Central America, or even the West Indies. So this video is going to be pretty much disproving those claims and proving the that the transatlantic slave trade did in fact did in fact occur so this video i mean so this book's entitled the universal gazetta or modern geographical index containing a concise description of the empire's kingdoms in the known world illustrated with six elegant maps by john watson published in 1794 so it says here the Portuguese have a number of black princes, their tributaries. There are some independent princes who have extensive dominions, particularly the kings of Widow and the Homi, both noted for the infamous slave trade. The European nations have traded with Africa in human flesh upwards of 200 years and encouraged in the Negro countries wars, raping, desolation and murder in order to supply the West Indian islands. The annual exportation of slaves from Africa has occasionally exceeded 100,000 numbers, of whom were driven now like sheep, perhaps 100 miles from the sea coast, being generally the inhabitants of villages that were surprised and carried off for the purchase of being sold to these traders. See that? So please keep in mind that this book was published in 1794. So this, this, this piece of literature is contemporary to that time period in which the slave trade was still occurring. Because in most countries, in, in most countries, slavery was still occurring until the mid to late 19th century. And this book was published, this book was published in the late 18th century. And it's telling you that an annual exportation of slaves was taken from Africa into the various American islands in the hundreds of thousands and they were pretty much just being taken and stolen um and it says here an attempt was lately made in the british parliament to get this barbarous traffic abolished but thought the court but though the cause of humanity was aided by the most convincing arguments and the most brilliant eloquence in opposition to interest and expediency it proved unsuccessful so even at that time, the British was trying to abolish slavery and they couldn't. It was still occurring, as I said, in many regions, slavery was still occurring well into the 19th century. So this is a primary source right here regarding the transatlantic slave trade. So right here. Okay, so this source is entitled The Town and Country Magazine or Universal Repository of Knowledge instruction and entertainment volume 20 published in 1788 so here it says facts repeat facts respect in africa and it's pretty much given it's pretty much given insight into the sea coast of africa so the west coast so here it just gives a bunch of details but right here is the crux of the matter so it says the numbers of slaves, or the, the number of the slaves purchased by the Europeans on this coast are prisoners taken in war, but many are sold for witchcraft and other real or imputed crimes, and death or slavery are in this country the punishments for almost every crime. You see that? So another primary source giving insight into the slave trade. So in certain regions on the west coast, this, those who will be those who will be importing the cargo slave ships were the criminals. Those who were committing crimes. So that was their punishment, as it said, their punishment for crime was either death or slavery. So 
So this sauce, got another sauce here. That's entitled the New Annual Register for General Repository of History, Politics, Arts, Sciences and Literature. Volume 32, published in 1790. Yeah, here it says, Mr. Wilberforce moved 12 propositions. So here it says, Mr. Wilberforce moved 12 propositions, upon which, however, he observed that he did not mean to urge them to an immediate vote. They stated the number of slaves annually carried from Africa, imported into the British West Indies, and entered into the customs, and entered into the custom house accounts. The number in the first of these articles amounting to 38,000. So when it's talking about British West, British West Indies, it's talking about Jamaica, Barbados, Montserrat, St. Kitts, Nevis. And I also believe it's talking about Trinidad and Tobago because the British had a monopoly over these islands at the time. And they were transporting slaves to these islands from the West Coast. So here it says they entered into the probable the merits of the persons sold to slavery the consequences produced upon the inhabitants of africa and the valuable and important commerce to that country which might be substituted in the room of the slave trade they stated the injury sustained by the british seamen and the fatal circumstances that attended the transportation to the slaves they detailed the causes of the they detailed the causes of the mortality of the negroes and enumerated the different items of calculation respecting the increase of population in Jamaica and Barbados and they concluded with declaring that it appeared that no considerable or permanent inconvenience would result from discontinuing the farther importation so yeah this this is basically saying that despite despite all the deaths and the illnesses suffered by the slaves and the seamen being transported from the west coast into these British West Indian islands, despite all this occurring, it's still not it's, it's still not enough to abolish the slave trade. We still want that free labour. That's pretty much what they're saying. So again, this is a primary source in 1790, whilst the slave trade was very much still in effect. Okay, so now we're going to see what one of the founding fathers of the United States of America, Benjamin Franklin, has to say concerning slavery, as he was also a contemporary to slavery, because he lived during the 18th century, and during the 18th century, slavery was at its zenith. It was at its height during that time. So he would have been very familiar with slavery. And during the 1750s, he wrote an essay concerning the observations of mankind, and within that essay, he actually touched on slavery. So we're going to see what he says, because this, this source right here published in 1760, it quotes from his exact essay concerning the observations of mankind. But before we even go into that, we're just going to, for those who don't know Benjamin Franklin, I'm just going to read this small little excerpt on Wikipedia. And it says, Benjamin Franklin was an American polymath. He was active as a writer, scientist, inventor, statesman, diplomat printer, publisher, and political philosopher. Among the leading intellectuals of his time, Franklin was one of the founding fathers of the United States, a drafter and signer of the Declaration of Independence and the first postmaster general. So yeah, this is him right here. Lived during the 18th century. So let's see what he says as an eyewitness. So here it says, the introduction of slaves, the Negroes brought into the sh Let me start that again. The introduction of slaves, the Negroes brought into the English Sugar Islands have greatly diminished the whites there. The poor are by this means deprived of employment. While a few families acquire vast estates, which they spend on foreign luxuries and educating their children in the habit of those luxuries, the same income is needed for the support of one that might have maintained 100. The whites who have not, the whites who have slaves not laboring, are enfeebled 
and therefore not so generally prolific. The slaves being worked too hard and ill-fed, their constitutions are broken and the, and the deaths among them are more than the births, so that a continual supply is needed from Africa. The northern colonies having few slaves increase in whites. Slaves also pejorate the families that use them. The white children become proud, disgusted with labour, and being educated and being educated in idleness are rendered unfit to get a living by industry. You see that? So yeah, man, this is coming out of the horse's mouth. He's saying that a continual supply of slaves is needed from Africa because of the high mortality rates among slaves. And please keep in mind that he was a contemporary to that time period. So if someone wants to deny it, then that's on them. But at the same time, he's a, he's an eyewitness. And again, this is this excerpt is from his essay written in the 1750s, entitled "Observations Concerning Mankind." And in that essay, he also touches on the complexion of various European nations and touches on the complexion of the indigenous populations of America and Asia or whatnot. And people use that excerpt when they want to prove their point regarding how the Germans looked or how the Spanish looked during that time. But he also touched on slavery during this time as well. And he, he spoke about Negroes being enslaved and being taken from the West Coast of Africa. So when we're analysing these pieces of literature, it's important that we're objective in our research. So this last source I'm going to get into is entitled The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Oluuda Equiano or Gustavus Vassa, the African, written by himself. First American edition published in 1791, volume 1. So it says here, Oluwuda Equiano, known for most of his life as, as Gustavus Vassa, was a writer and abolitionist from, according to his memoir, the village of Ekas Esaka in modern southern Nigeria. Enslaved as a child in Africa, he was shipped to the Caribbean and sold to a Royal Navy officer. He was sold twice more before purchasing his freedom in 1766. So here, that's him right there. And he was, he was of the Igbo tribe. And here it says, as a freedman in London, Equiano supported the British abolitionist movement. Equiano was part of the abolitionist group, the Sons of Africa, whose members were Africans living in Britain, and he was a leader of the abolitionism movement in the 1780s. His 1789 autobiography, The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Oluwudo Equiano, helped secure passage of the British Slave Trade Act, 1807 which abolished the slave trade and sold so well that nine editions were published during his life. The interest in narrative gained renewed popularity among scholars in the late 20th century and remains a useful primary source. See that? So this is a first-hand account written by the man himself about his experience as a slave. So, I mean, if you want, if, if you want to dispute this, then that's on you. So here it says, the first object which saluted my eyes when I arrived on the coast was the sea and a slave ship, which was then riding at anchor and waiting for its cargo. These filled me with astonishment, which was soon converted into terror. When I was carried on board, I was immediately handled and tossed up to sea if I were found by some of the crew. And I was now persuaded that I had gotten into a world of bad spirits and that they were going to kill me. Their complexions too different so much from ours. Their long hair and the language they spoke, which was very different from any I had ever heard, united to confirm me in this belief. So, <laughs> so yeah, he, he's pretty much saying that when he saw the white men on board, he didn't even regard them as human beings. He regarded them as spirits. Indeed, such were the horrors of my views and fears at the moment that if ten if ten thousand worlds had been my own, I would have freely parted with them all to have exchanged my condition with that of the meanest slave in my own country. 
when I looked around the ship and I saw a large furnace or copper boiling and a multitude of black people of every description chained together, every one of their countenances expressing dejection and sorrow, I no longer doubted of my fate and quite overpowered with horror and anguish, I fell motionless on the deck and fainted. When I recovered a little, I found some black people about me, I believe were on, who I believe were some of those who had brought me on board and had been receiving their pay. They talked to me in order to cheer me, but all in vain. I asked them if, I asked them if we were not to be beaten by those white men. I mean, I asked them if we were, if we were not to be eaten by those white men with horrible looks, red faces and long hair. They told me I was not, and one of the crew bought me a small portion of spiritus liquor in a wine glass, but being afraid of him, I would not take it out of his hand. One of the blacks therefore took it from him and gave it to me, and I took it and I took a little down my palate, which instead of reviving me, as they thought it would, threw me into the threw me into the greatest consternation at the strange feeling it produced, having never tasted any such liquor before. Soon after this, the blacks who brought me on board went off and left me abandoned to despair. I now, I now saw myself deprived of all chance of returning to my native country, or even the least glimpse of hoping of gaining the shore, which I now considered as friendly. And I even wished for my former slavery in preference to my present situation, which was filled with horrors of every kind, still heightened by my ignorance of what I was to undergo. I was not long suffered to indulge in my grief. I was soon put down under the I was soon put down under the decks, and there I received such a salutation in my nostrils as I had never experienced in my life. So that the so that with the loath, loathsomeness of the stench and crying together, I became so sick and low that I was not able to eat, nor had I the least desire to taste anything. I now wish for the last friend, death to relieve me but soon to my grief two of the white men offered me to two of the white men offered me eatables and on my refusing to eat one of them held one of them held me fast by the hands and laid me across i think the windlass and tied my feet while the other flogging me severely i had never experienced anything of this kind before so yeah man and this is just pretty much describing his experience on the slave ship. And we can, as we can see, it was pretty gruesome. It was terrible. It was a terrible experience. The white men offered him something to eat. And based off his refusal, they started beating him. So, um, so yeah, man, this is a very good read. I would advise people to read this. It's entitled The Interesting Narrative of the Life of the Equiano and he also goes into other things too in the first chapter he talks about how the Igbos have many customs that's similar to the Israelites and um yeah it's just an interesting read overall and yeah for those who still want to deny the the veracity of the transatlantic slave trade it's pretty much just a spit in the face to our forefathers and foremothers that went through these gruesome experiences because we can see here a, a, a first-hand account of someone who experienced it firsthand, and he's a, he's describing his experience on the slave on the slave ship and how he was treated and how other black people were treated on the slave ships and how they were going through malnutrition, they were going through all types of diseases, they were getting thrown off the slave ships, they were getting whipped. Now these are the type of things he was talking about, and for people to just outright deny the slave trade without any sort of um, historical doc historical documentation to substantiate these claims is just vain. Because when we're dealing with history, we gotta make sure that we have things to support our thesis. Because for the for the people that deny the existence or the veracity of the transatlantic slave trade, there's no real thesis to support their claims. There's no historical literature that they're gonna go to. That's going to back up their claims. Because in this video I went through six pieces of primary sources. That substantiate the transatlantic slave trade. And proves its veracity. 
and this is just a small fraction there's hundreds out there i, I, I could have literally went through hundreds of different sources but for the sake of the video i, I obviously just went through six because really and truly the only way a person could deny this is by saying that the documents that I was reading in this video was falsified. And if you're going to use that thesis, then you're going to you're going to have to use that same thesis for every piece of historical document out there. And that that includes the documents that supports your arguments for certain things that you convey historically. So it's just you can't really use that argument. I mean, you're just going to have to deal with the evidence. And that's just what it's going to be, whether it aligns with the narrative that you're trying to perpetuate or not. But I just got, um, here I've got this, I've got this last piece of evidence here. It says, the slave coast is a historical name formerly used for that part of coastal West Africa along the Bight of, Bi along the Bight of Biafra and the Bight of Benin that is located between Volta River and the Lagos Lagoon. The name is derived from the region's history. The name is derived from the region's history as a major source of African people sold into slavery during the transatlantic slave trade from early 16th century to the late 19th century. So here's a map. And as you can see there, it says, it says slave coast. Here it says gold coast. Here it says grain coast. Well, yeah, here it says, it says Slave Coast. And this map is dated to 1729. Right? And on a different map, I think it's, it's the map engraving from 1747. Where it says Slave Coast, it, will, it would say the Kingdom of Judah. Because you had the law of Israelites dwelling within that region. He was also taken as slaves. But, um... That's obviously another video for another day. Um, and the point of this video wasn't necessarily to prove who was actually taken from the West Coast to the Americas. It was pretty much just to prove the veracity of the, of the slave trade. And that was pretty much it. So, um, so, yeah, I think that will conclude the end of the video.